afternoon, your highnesses, excellencies, dignitaries, members of the ABLF network and our wonderful guests today. My name is Reshm Katecha. I'm a policy and strategy specialist based in the UK and I am absolutely delighted to be here at the ABLF where I'll be moderating two back-to-back -back sessions. These sessions feature two brilliant men, William Dalrymple and Shashi Tharoor, and they are renowned for many things, including their knowledge, their oratory, and of course, their impressive books. So I'm absolutely delighted to announce our speaker for the next 30 minutes is William Dalrymple. He is a Scottish historian and writer, an art historian and curator, as well as a broadcaster and critic. His books have won numerous awards and prizes. He is the co-founder of the Jaipur Literature Fest. And if you haven't read his book, The Anarchy, which we'll be discussing now, I strongly recommend you go out and buy it after this so you can learn a bit more about his fantastic research and work. So William, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank, you. thank you for that generous intro. Pleasure, very well earned. And if you could just start by explaining to people how an organization that was made up of ex Caribbean pirates um, became, as the East India Company, the world's first multinational corporation, but also an imperial power that was able to conquer India, the richest empire in the world at the time. People still talk broadly about the British uh, conquering India as if it was some sort of national project run out of Downing Street or the Foreign Office or with the, the Royal Navy and the British Army in charge. But one of the strangest quirks of history was that it wasn't anything to do with the government at all. It was a, a privately financed uh, joint stock company, uh, the East India Company, um, which was one of the world's very first uh, joint stock companies. It was founded in 1599, a first voyage in the early years of the 17th century. The staff of its ships were, uh, as you rightly said, ex-Caribbean pirates, the real-life equivalents of Johnny Depp and so on. Uh, and initially they were very much bit part players in uh, a world dominated by much richer and more sophisticated countries. The uh, Portuguese, uh, had already been sailing backwards and forwards to Goa and, and had their own uh, coastal empire there. Uh, the Dutch uh, were competing very successfully uh, to be the dominant figures in the spice trade. And most powerful of all, by a long way, the Mughal Empire, which was then producing about a quarter of the world's gross domestic product. Today, um, people are beginning to think about India again as a very rich country, but it's uh, uh, it's been a turnaround because ever since the colonial period, uh, India has been viewed largely uh, as a poor place. Now, that was very much not the case uh, in the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries when uh, under the Mughals, uh, India was manufacturing uh, vast quantities of, of high quality goods that were in desire around the world, uh, and particularly textiles. And it was through uh, cooperating with Mughal Bengal in particular, the East India Company became, first of all, an incredibly rich uh, trading company. Uh, so rich that it was, for example, um, you have deindustrialization in Mexico, as far away as Mexico, uh, with the amount of cheap Indian cotton being made in Bengal and sent over the world by East India Company ships and sold for profit over there. But uh, in, the, in the middle of the 18th century, there is an extraordinary uh, bit of history, just as the Mughal Empire is breaking up and this previously incredibly powerful world uh, shatters into a hundred pieces. Uh, there's a military revolution in Europe. Uh, the new military techniques invented by Frederick the Great uh, are introduced by uh, the French and the British companies into India, uh, and often in, in competition with each other, uh, they begin to bite off great chunks of, of, of what had been the Mughal Empire, which is now this sort of fractured world of different competing states. Uh, and the final factor that really makes a difference, as well as the breakup of the Mughal Empire and the importing of, of, of amazing new military technology, is the fact that there is a considerable body of financiers in India, particularly the Mawari community, uh, particularly the Jagat Set uh, organization based out of Murshidabad, which was then the richest capital in India, in, uh, uh, in Bengal. The Jagat Sets and the other Mawaris choose to back the company as the least worst option when uh, the Marathas are marauding around the country, burning 
uh, uh, the, uh, the, the settlements of Bengal, when the Mughal Empire is contracted to just Delhi and everything in between is, is given way to a form of anarchy uh, with dog eat dog in village after village. And the Mawaris and the other Indian bankers choose to back the company with their finance. And it's with Indian capital and using Indian troops that the East India Company conquers the whole of the Mughal Empire by the end of the 19th century. It's an extraordinary fact. You're, it's not British money and British troops. It's not the British government. It's a, a multinational company using Indian capital uh, in a, uh, a, 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 and, and, and using that capital to buy Indian mercenaries. And, and that's the most unlikely force that conquers India. That's the fascinating and often unknown thing that it was partly a choice by bankers to choose, as you say, the lesser of two evils. But your book also highlights the moment that the East India Company shifted from that trading corporation into an imperial power in 1765. And in particular, it really shows the juxtaposition of the two men, Robert Clive and Shah Alam, who created that shift. So can you tell us more about that and the involuntary privatization that occurred? So the first big battle that takes place between the East India Company and the governors uh, of the of Bengal, the Mughal governors, uh, is the Battle of Plassey in 1757. And that really provides the bridgehead uh, for the company to fan out across the company, to begin to loot and asset strip and to take over as territorial conquerors. And that inevitably produces a reaction from the rest of the Mughal Empire. And in, uh, 1764 to 5, there is a series of conflicts with the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam, uh, his most powerful general, who's a man called Shuja Daula uh, of Lucknow, uh, and the Nawab of Bengal. All three gather together with a huge army uh, and try to expel the East India Company. But the uh, final battle at the Battle of Baksa. Uh, is uh, uh, it, it goes goes in a quite different direction, and the three Mughal armies are defeated, uh, and the Mughal emperor is captured and forced to sign uh, what's known as the Diwani, uh, the, the the Treaty of Allahabad, which effectively hands over economic control of the three richest provinces of India, that's Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa, to the East India Company. So you have this bizarre situation where a great chunk, the richest chunk of North India is ruled not by uh, a state, but by a, a for-profit multinational company uh, whose only job uh, is, to, uh, is to make profits for its shareholders. So inevitably, its, its priority is to extract as much wealth from India as possible and ship it back to Britain about shareholders i think again uh, a fact a little known fact i think that you share is exactly who the shareholders were and why british parliament had such a vested interest in enabling the east india company so what was that about um, and why was it deemed too big to fail as an organization good question Rishim. the so what happens is that the uh, the company um among its shareholders, about a quarter of MPs hold East India Company stock and so have a vested interest, as you say, in the company succeeding. But while the company is you know, aiming its guns primarily against uh, Indian players, particularly the, the, the Mughals in Bengal and then the Mughals in, uh, in, well, in Uttar Pradesh, the, the Kingdom of Avad, um, they've always got their eye on the British Parliament. Uh, and the East India Company is the first multinational corporation which realizes that you can control a government through lobbying, through bribery. And uh, in 1695, uh, less than a century after the founding of the East India Company, you have the first ever corporate corruption scandal when the directors of the company are found offering uh, share options to the uh, MPs to in order to get them to vote to extend its monopoly. Now, you know, in, in the 20th and 21st century, we're very familiar with the whole uh, grey world of, uh, of companies offering different forms of inducement, whether just in terms of lunches or corporate jollies uh, or uh, outright corruption. 
uh, to politicians. And, and this is something, you know, which is true, uh, as true in uh, Great Britain as it is in, uh, 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 in, uh, in India. And I'm sure it would never happen, of course, in, 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 uh, in the Middle East. And uh, um, this world is invented by the company. The company is the first time you get a very powerful corporation that realizes that it can bend the will of states. Uh, and it can uh, not only actually conquer states as it's doing in India, it can influence parliament through lobbying, through corruption, through self-interest. And very soon you get a situation where you have a sort of confusion between what is the interests of the shareholders of East India Company and what is in the interests of, uh, of the British state. And the company is very good at exploiting that gray area. When it wants to, for example, it can call in uh, uh, British Navy ships to protect its interests in India from French naval maneuvers. Uh, but on the other hand, when it wins, uh, uh, you know, a great chunk of India by, uh, by military means, it's very clear that its rights are those of a company, not those of the crown. So, uh, you know, like many large corporations today, like Facebook or Exxon Mobil, uh, 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 Saudi Aramco is, I suppose, a slightly different uh, uh, story, but uh, Google and Facebook, there is a fraught relationship with the state. Uh, we saw yesterday in the American elections the way that Twitter uh, was blocking or, uh, um, what's the word, uh, highlighting the inaccuracies in President Trump's uh, election tweets. Now, there you have a classic example of a conflict between a state and a corporation. Uh, and this, this same tension between a, 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 a state which can give favors and a corporation which can provide finance for a government and which enriches a country is there for the first time highlighted in the history of the East India Company. So I found continually that I, when I was writing 18th century history, uh, there were so many places which it overlapped with the uh, with the politics of the present and, and, you know, the way, for example, that ExxonMobil maybe did or did not know. Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. Those sort of ways in which corporate links with government can alter foreign policy. Uh, these are the kind of things that I've been exploring in the 18th century. And, uh, and this is where they begin. This is the origin of that whole world. And you talked about the East India Company being able to deliver finance to the British government and the British state. And you also talked about there being a conflict sometimes between what was best for the company and what was best for the British state. Um, so coming to that, um, the East India Company was not just the first company to demonstrate scandal or undue influence over government. It was also the first company to require bailout because it was too big to fail. So how did that happen when we tend to think of the East India Company as a purely financial successful endeavor? It's, it's a very telling tale, Rachel. But the East India Company in the aftermath of the signing of the Treaty of Allahabad, the Diwani that we talked about in, in 1765, when they, having defeated the Mughals, they seized control uh, of the economy of uh, uh, the richest provinces of India. And what do they do? They're there to make a profit. They, you know, there's no talk of that you get in the later British Empire of a civilizing mission or uh, the, the duty of the imperial power to, to uplift its, its subjects or anything like that. The company is a company. It exists to enrich its shareholders. It's very clear about that. There's no hypocrisy. There's no cant. Uh, and they literally asset strip Bengal. Uh, but they do so in such a clumsy way that they effectively um, uh, strangle the uh, goose which lays the golden eggs. Uh, and so you get this um, situation in 1770 when there's a famine, when it's discovered that the, the East India Company, who, you know, which is there only to make a profit, hasn't even thought of laying in grain uh, to feed its uh, subjects as when the monsoon fails, which would have been the norm in, in any other state in Indian history. So you get many millions, the numbers are disputed. Uh, there are figures given between three and 10 million deaths in Bengal. Uh, it's probably nearer three than 10, but it's a horrific figure all the same. Uh, and um, the company doesn't even set up a single soup kitchen. 
is to send out troops into the villages to uh, to gather finance uh, and tax the people. And by year three, they've stripped Bengal so uh, so badly of its assets uh, that uh, they that, that, that there are no profits. The company goes bankrupt, and it has to be bailed out by the British state, rather like Nat West uh, in the 2008 banking crisis. Uh, so you get a, a situation where what had been an example of libertarian free market capitalism into what we today would effectively call a, a public-private partnership, uh, with the government holding a 50% a share of the East India Company. British public at the time respond to what the East India Company was doing in India and to the three to ten million deaths that had been caused by their that by their looting. The East India Company becomes rather like the uh, the, the merchant bankers of the 1980s. They they become subject to uh, a lot of very hostile press. Um, people love to hate the East India Company nabobs, and as with the uh, dislike of bankers in the 1980s or Wall Street uh, uh, in the 1980s. Uh, a lot of it, of course, has to do with envy. That you know, it's people who see these guys going out. Uh, uh, fairly uh, impoverished to India in their teens and coming back with vast fortunes uh, in their 30s, buying country houses, buying parliamentary seats, um, snaffling the, the most beautiful heiresses and so on. Uh, and, uh, and so they're, they're, they are hugely uh, disliked. And one of the I suppose, most encouraging things about uh, this, this very sorry story of, of how one British company looted and asset stripped uh, great chunks of India is the fact that the British public does respond uh, with, with a, 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 a outrage uh, and you get plays put on in, in the West End of London. Uh, Clive, who's held responsible for much of this, uh, is satirized as Lord Vulture. Uh, and, uh, and so no, there is, a, there is a, a great deal of dislike of the company and, and this continues to grow until in the 1850s, uh, after the Great Uprising, uh, what the British called the Indian Mutiny, what the Indians called the First War of Independence, uh, the company is actually rolled up uh, and privatized, uh, and the, the British Crown steps in. Uh, and you have the beginning of the British Raj, which only actually begins in 1858. What's interesting to me is the way that uh, so much of the history of the British in India has been focused on the British Raj and, and, and how the much longer period of the East India Company been erased from popular consciousness. Uh, the East India Company was around from 1600 until 1858, in other words, 250 years. But the British Raj, oddly enough, only lasted 90 years um, uh, and uh, uh, it lasted from 1858 to 1947, during which time, of course, it also controlled a great deal of the Gulf. Uh, and uh, what we often forget is, is the degree to which the uh, what were then called the trucial states in the Gulf uh, were controlled out of the British Raj from Calcutta uh, and used across the Gulf until uh, in some places the 1970s. Hey, just before we move on to talk a little bit about the Victorians, um, could anything have stopped the East India Company and then the British from becoming the imperial power that they did. I know you mentioned uh, the French and the Portuguese a little while ago. Could anyone or anything have stopped the East India Company either within India or from outside it? Indeed, I mean, if you look at the history, uh, the the rise of the company is, is absolutely not, uh, not something which is guaranteed or inevitable. Uh, there are throughout its history, a whole series of very tight scrapes. And there are innumerable periods when uh, different powers, whether it's Tipu Sultan of Mysore, uh, the great Maratha Confederacy out of Pune, uh, the various Mughal factions, uh, each one of those at different times inflict defeats on the East India Company. And there are various points when with a little bit of extra push, uh, it would have been very easy to have expelled the company from India. Um, but uh, these are, you know, the, the ifs of history. The reality is that the company, um, partly through military innovation uh, and introducing military techniques unknown in India, but very largely through 
it's superior financing. At the end of the day, the company can field more troops, better paid troops, more regularly paid troops with better arms uh, and uh, and uh, than the rival Indian states. And it's this mixture of uh, of sound financing by Indian bankers uh, and its own shareholders. Uh, uh, and uh, and innovative military technology, which gives the company the edge over much richer, larger, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, powers all around it. A lot about the military powers, and the reality is, as you you demonstrate in your book, that there were people in India who really fought hard. Um, you talk about Tipu Sultan who fought four wars against the British uh, unsuccessfully in the end, but what was that like? Because I think that's something that's often not talked about very often. Tipu Sultan is uh, a hate figure for the Hindutva right. Uh, and over the course of the last 50 years, he's moved from being a kind of nationalist hero um, for the reason that he he was the one Indian power that never allied with the company. He always opposed them and did so very effectively. But uh, it's also true that uh, Tipu Sultan uh, was a very uncompromising victor. And when he defeated his enemies, uh, he didn't believe in, uh, in, in treating them kindly. Uh, uh, the various Hindu powers like the Marathas who took him on had their temples burnt. Uh, Christians in Kerala, I know there are many uh, Christians in the Gulf, maybe some are listening to this today. Uh, uh, many Keralans have very uh, 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 negative ancestral memories of Tipu's uh, destruction of, of both uh, Hindu and Christian sites in Kerala. And the British too, uh, when, when, when uh, Tipu defeated his enemies, as, as he frequently did. And, uh, the East India Company was three times defeated by Tipu. Uh, he would capture people, murder them, uh, forcibly convert them to Islam. Uh, and among those captured and imprisoned uh, was, was one of my ancestors, who I write about in the book, James Durrimple. So he's both a, a, an incredibly fierce fighter, uh, a heroic uh, defender of his realm against foreign uh, imperialism and someone who made many enemies through excessively violent retribution in victory. Um, and the company struggled with him. There were three Anglo Mysore wars. It was only in the final one in 1799 that Tipu was finally cornered on his island fortress of Sri Rangapatnam uh, and, uh, 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 and murdered, uh, and his, his, uh, his, his island capital looted. And plundered with the uh, many of the treasures that he'd amassed, including the, this golden throne and uh, uh, amazing uh, armory with with uh, many uh, items of which had his tiger symbol engraved in gold upon his swords and, and, and pistols and cannon and so on. Uh, these were all shipped back to England and now sit in places like the National Trust property at Powys Castle in Wales, where. Uh, there is more Mughal and, and Mysore loot than in any museum uh, in, in Great Britain. Uh, sorry, any museum in India or Pakistan or Afghanistan. And so uh, rulers and fighters like Tipu were, were partly able to help the Victorians caricature themselves as being the saviors of Indians from these callous emperors. How much of that, um, if at all, is true that the Victorians helped save the Indians from some of these atrocities? This element in, in the story, I mean, the, the bankers who supported the company were almost always Hindu or Jain. Um, many of them uh, uh, chose to back the company specifically against the, the Muslim uh, Mughals. Uh, and um, there was a, uh, an element that the, the, the particularly the Bengalis uh, chose to support the company. Uh, over uh, their own Muslim co-religionists, uh, and uh, and there is an element of truth in that. There's no question that that that, that there are, that there are figures who chose to back the company uh, because they had unhappy memories of of Mughal rule. Uh, but this was certainly something that the British exploited and used to divide and rule. 
Uh, although you don't actually find the term divide, divide and rule used until a little bit later in the Victorian period, the principle uh, was certainly understood by people like Lord Wellesley. Uh, and when he is going to war against Tipu, he quite unfairly um, uh, makes him out to be, I mean, using very language very similar to that used by uh, George Bush during the Gulf War when talking about people like Saddam Hussein, this intolerant tyrant, this terrorist, this... Uh, uh, this barbarian, um, which kind of was only partly true. I mean, Tipu was certainly a, a, a fierce fighter and, a, uh, and, and he used the language of jihad, but he was very far from a barbarian. He was extremely uh, innovative ruler. He had state trading companies. He had uh, shipping, which he sent off to the Gulf. He tried to buy the, the port of Hormuz. Um, he uh, introduced silk farming. Uh, and was an, an incredibly sophisticated and innovative ruler, and as I say, the, in a sense, the most effective ruler in 18th century uh, India. Uh, and the company caricatured him and turned him uh, into this sort of uh, cartoon figure uh, of what a, uh, a, an intolerant Muslim ruler uh, uh, could be. Uh, and this was the stereotype which has survived to this day. Uh, uh, and which Islamophobes around the world still exercise. We talked over the course of this session about some of the parallels between um, the East India Company and its takeover, the, the colonization of India and the way corporates behave now. Um, other than that, why does this form of global storytelling impact countries outside the UK and India? And why is sharing this story still important today? Well, the East India Company was not just concerned with India by any stretch of the imaginations. It had interests, well, in the Gulf, obviously. The, the Gulf was first pulled into uh, the British net, so to speak, uh, uh, by the company, not by the Raj. Uh, and uh, uh, by the 1780s, the company had become a global uh, multinational, the first global multinational. It certainly had its territorial base in India. Uh, but it used that from the 1780s onwards to trade, to grow opium, which it sold in China. Uh, it was because of, uh, to protect its opium trade and to develop it, that the famous opium wars were fought in the 1840s. Uh, Hong Kong was seized uh, and uh, led to what the Chinese to this day call the century of humiliation. Uh, and this apparently uh, is something which still very much scars the Chinese psyche today and, and, and very much uh, informs the way that uh, the Chinese today look at the rest of the world and, and, and something which they're determined to make sure never happens again. Uh, then they take the opium uh, uh, to China, they, they buy Chinese tea and they sell that not just in India and the Gulf, but in Europe and America. And it's East India Company tea, which is dumped in Boston Harbor at the Boston Tea Party, uh, which is the kickoff of the American Revolution. So the company, which starts off as this sort of, you know, a very small scale, uh, amateurish uh, uh, company in Shakespeare's London, ends up as a true global player with as much global influence in the late 18th and early 19th centuries as, as ExxonMobil or Facebook or Google have in the modern world. So yes, it's very much a story that has global significance, not just uh, uh, specific to Britain and India. So you, you mentioned that in the 19th century, the East India Company was privatized. Um, how did it go from being a privatized but incredibly wealthy and influential corporation into its decline? So the company, um, it started its decline, I suppose, with the, with this bankruptcy in 1774, where it has to be bailed out by the British state, and the state takes a, 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 a chunk of its shares uh, as its price, a controlling uh, a controlling share of the company. And from that point, uh, it suffers a small power. The the company more and more um, uh, loses. Uh, monopolies that it has gained. So by the 1830s, other trading organizations are allowed in. And, and so it's companies, for example, like uh, Jardine Matheson and various Parsi companies based out of Bombay, 
uh, who dominate the the uh, heyday of the opium trade. Uh, the East India Company no longer has a monopoly in that by the 1840s when the opium wars are fought. Uh, and uh, by the 1850s, the company has really been reduced to a sort of governing corporation rather than the BBC. A major player in trade. And then finally, it's privatized. But uh, the, the period between about, I don't know, um, uh, 1700 and 1780 uh, is the moment that the East India Company is as powerful, really, as any state on the globe. And, and remarkably, it's private army. The East India Company's private security force in 1799 is literally exactly double the size of the British Army. Uh, there are around 100,000 troops in the British Army just before the British rearmed to fight Napoleon. Uh, and at that point, there are 200,000 sepoys uh, enlisted in the East India Company Army. So you have this bizarre situation where a private company, a for-profit, uh, acting only in the interest of its directors and shareholders, uh, has the largest modern army in Asia. Um, the equivalent today would be Facebook with fighter jets or uh, Google with nuclear submarines. Bear thinking about it. Terrifying thought that would be. And you talk in your book, The Anarchy, about some of your ancestors who went over to India. Um, was going to India for people in, the, in Britain seen as a way to make your future? Was that something wealthy, well-connected people did? Or was that something people did when they needed to make a life for themselves? Exactly like the decision to become a, 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 a banker or a hedge fund manager today. Uh, it's not a career uh, which necessarily gives you uh, an easy time. I remember when you know, the merchant bankers uh, who, uh, who left university with me, I would be getting up and going to the office at nine o'clock. They'd have been getting up at five and working from early dawn and probably not getting out of the office till midnight. Uh, the East India Company was the same, but only more so. If you joined the company, you had to join by the age of 16, you were shipped off to India, and two thirds of the young men age 16 who left Britain never came back again. Uh, so it's, it wasn't just that it was a, uh, a, a, a hard career, uh, it was a career that almost certainly, um, not almost certainly, but, but you know, there was a two thirds, two -thirds chance of, of not surviving it. Um, and so people who joined the company, so, uh, who included many of my ancestors, were never the dukes and earls and marquises and, and the upper aristocracy um, because it was simply too dangerous. You know, the chances are you'd never see your kids again if you signed them up to the company. The people who joined were people that needed the cash uh, and yet had a certain measure of, of influence. So my family were, were, were uh, lowland Scottish politicians uh, who always had social aspirations greater than their purse. And they were exactly the sort of people that poured into the company. Likewise vicar's sons from Northern Ireland, minor gentry from Wales, and so on. Uh, and for that class, who never quite had the money that they wanted, who had too many younger sons, who could never inherit any land that there was, uh, the company provided uh, a high risk option. Uh, but if you survived the first two monsoons, which were always the fatal ones, because the British uh, didn't have the genetic uh, uh, defenses against Indian diseases, you know, cholera and typhoid and so on. Um, they survived their first two monsoons and lived into their 30s. The chances were that they could come back with a massive fortune. And, and these East India Company fortunes were one of the two big uh, sources of cash which turned Britain from a relatively peripheral player in Europe. Uh, much poorer than the French or the Portuguese or the Spanish or even the Italians, uh, to by the by the uh, middle of the nineteenth century to the uh, the world's largest industrial power, and the seed finance which powered the industrial revolution at the end of the eighteenth century came from really two sources. One was the East India Company's plunder, loot, and exploitation of India. The other was the Caribbean slave trade, um, out of particularly Jamaica. Uh, which was a massive money spinner for many uh, for many British families. 
And what was life like for these British people who did go over to India, providing they survived those first two monsoons? Did they interact with the local people or were they kept separate and, and just there to rule over them? Oh, very interesting. One of the, I said that you know one of the attractive things about the company was that there was no cant about uh, about a, a civilizing mission. They were there to make money and were very clear about that. Another of, of the things that, in a sense, slightly redeems this this very dark period of history is the fact that there was far less racism at this period, uh, and there was a great deal of intermarriage. These kids were sent out age sixteen, uh, and very few of them came back until their forties, and uh, one third of them uh, in the 1780s and 90s were marrying Indian women. And so if you look at the wills of the East India Company um, uh, officers from that period, you find that many of them have Anglo-Indian children, that they're wearing Indian clothes, they're eating Indian food, um, <clears throat> and they're living in, a, in you know, mixed households with, with Indian women and Indian families. Um, so it's a very different deal to the Raj that is so familiar to us from BBC TV dramas or Kipling or, or uh, Curzon or all the stuff that we associate with the British in India. It was a world that was nakedly exploit exploitative uh, and made no bones about being there entirely for profit. On the other hand, it was one that was done very collaboratively. Collaborative in the sense that you know it was using Indians' bankers' capital to buy Indian mercenary troops, collaborative in that the British officers were often adopting Indian ways, wearing Indian clothes, and having Indian children from Indian women. Uh, and, and I'm fascinated by how far different this is to the image of, uh, of the British Raj, as, as certainly I was taught it at school. caused that shift from uh, exploitative but collaborative people able to intermarry and live together because as you say that's not the idea or the understanding we have now of what life was really like so what caused that shift into uh, the Raj that we are more familiar with where you wouldn't have seen those interracial marriages or the communities being so collaborative and living together in some form of slight harmony There are two things that really change uh, change this. Uh, one is kind of the, the the superpower status of the British from about eight, uh, 1800 onwards. They they get arrogant, and you could draw a parallel, I think, with you know America under Bush at the peak of the American Empire when uh, the Berlin Wall had collapsed in 89, uh, and there was no longer a Soviet Union to be seen as a rival. And the Americans got very arrogant. They they believed it was you know, that they had discovered the way to live, the way to run the world, the way to uh, to be. Uh, and all uh, uh, American effort after 9/11 to export democracy in the American way around the world. That was one thing. The second thing I think was the rise in Britain of evangelical Christianity. Uh, you get from the uh, 1790s, but particularly in the 1800s, 1810s, 1820s, this rise of very fanatical, uh, hardline Protestant Christianity in Britain. Uh, and uh, while the 18th century East India Company had seen Hindus, for example, as a source of ancient wisdom, and Sir William Jones was busy translating the Vedas and uh, uh, learning Sanskrit, and, and, and there was enthusiastic mapping of Indian antiquities, by the 1830s, you had the very familiar tropes of Victorian racism. Uh, the Indians uh, were no longer interesting representatives of, a, 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 of an ancient civilization. They were instead poor, benighted, heathen, ripe only for conversion. Uh, and Oh, William, I've lost you slightly. I'm not sure if that's your end or my end. So I'll ask the next question in the case it's your end. Um, you talk about religion, uh, evangelical Christianity, really driving that change uh, from the British. And you've outlined earlier on about divide and rule as um, an unspoken initially method for infiltrating India and taking control. How much did religion in India play a part in enabling the East India Company and then the British to colonize?
I think I think it was a factor. Um, the Mughals succeeded in India by creating this enormous coalition uh, under Akbar, who was the real creator of the uh, Mughal Empire. Um, uh, there was uh, uh, equality of all religions, the jizya, uh, the, the, the Islamic tax on, uh, on non-Muslims was abolished. Um, particularly the Rajputs from Rajasthan were promoted to be uh, the uh, crack troops of the Mughal army. Uh, and uh, the, the Rajputs did very well out of the, uh, uh, the, the Mughal Empire, uh, intermarrying with the Mughals. Uh, providing the mothers of many of the emperors. Uh, and uh, it was the Mughals created in a sense a coalition of interest um, uh, under which Hindus and Muslims uh, profited together uh, in the Mughal Empire. Now that broke out, broke up, uh, introduced a far more hardline Islamist uh, form of uh, Islam back into India. The jizya was reimposed on Hindus. Uh, there was uh, destruction of temples. And this alienated great swathes of previously supportive Hindu peoples and caused the, uh, the great Maratha uprising in, in the west of India with Shivaji uh, attacking and defeating the, the Mughals. And so that cleavage between Hindus and Muslims, which had not been there uh, during the Mughal period, or at least uh, any wounds that had been there had healed and, 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 and the two were operating very well. By the time that the East India Company was rising up, there was tension between Hindus and Muslims. And the company, as I say, exploited that. And you often find uh, the company allying with the Marathas against Tipu Sultan, for example. Uh, you find uh, uh, this, this long-standing alliance that we've talked about between the Mawari bankers and the East India Company against the Mughals and against Tipu uh, and so, yes, this was this was one of a number of factors which allowed the British to the British East India Company to exploit the divisions and uh, and seize India. But the single most important uh, division was not religion; it was po politics. And the fact that once the Mughal Empire had broken up, India had dissolved from one unitary state with four million men under arms to thousands of little states which could be picked off individually. And it was that sense that there was a, a totally divided political field which only on two or three occasions united against the company. Uh, it was that political division rather than religious division uh, which really allowed the company to seize control. And, th and this bizarre fact of, of, of one British company out of one building in, in the city of London only five windows wide, you know, much smaller than most corporate headquarters in Dubai today, uh, that this, this one office block uh, effectively seized control of the richest country in the world. It's been so incredible. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. One final question. What is there in your book, The Anarchy, that we haven't covered so far that would surprise readers if you had to pick one thing? We've, we've really been sort of talking about several books. The Anarchy uh, is the story of how the East India Company uh, rose to power. But we've also been talking more recently, I think, Resham, about uh, the intermarriage of uh, Indians and, and the British and, and the cultural adoption by British East India Company men of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Indian ways. And that's in a different book called, called The Last Movie. Sorry, called, called The White Movie. Uh, and uh, there's a third book I wrote called The Last Mughal, which tells the story of the final uh, end of the Mughal Empire under Bahadur Shah Zafar. So in all, uh, there's, I've written this company quartet. And, and, and uh, if anyone wants to learn more about the East India Company and its relation with India and the rest of the world, um, all four books uh, I, I, would, I would love to recommend, obviously, to, <laughs> to readers. Well, I can recommend them too. So thank you so much, William, for your time today. That's been absolutely fascinating. And for anyone who hasn't read William's books or watched him interview on uh, YouTube or on podcasts, I would highly recommend it. If you were unable to catch the beginning or the middle of this interview and you would like to hear all about it, which I would recommend because William is so fascinating, then you can watch this talk and all the other ABLF talks on demand. 
If you are sharing anything on social media or tweeting, please make sure you do so with the hashtag ABLF City. I know some of you will be wanting to watch the Shashi Tarora event that was due to start a little while ago. Unfortunately, Shashi is having some technical issues on his side, so that session will start a little late. You'll be sent emails with details of exactly when that's starting, so I hope you will um, join back to watch that because it will be fascinating as we talk about new globalization. So William, thanks once again for joining. Please do join the rest of the ABLF talks and do tweet and, and use social media to share your thoughts. If there is a global leader you would like to be interviewed on these ABLF talks, please do get in touch with the team and recommend them and we will do our very best to get them for you next month. Thank you so much and have a lovely day. Mm -hmm.